Welcome to the If You Could See Me podcast. Thank you for joining the movement. I'm your host, Erin Mahone. I'm an author, storyteller, facilitator, and mental health professional. I like to talk about big things, ask difficult questions, and challenge the ways in which we perceive ourselves, one another, and what's possible in the world. On this podcast, I speak to thinkers, makers, feelers, and folks fighting for change. You'll experience entertaining, thought-provoking conversations with people from all walks of life. I believe that mental health is health, and it goes so far beyond conversations about illness, medications, and treatment. Our mental health is essential to living our best lives, and I want to live in a world in which we talk about emotional wellness as easily and frequently as talking about the common cold. We aren't there yet but I believe we can be. When I set out to create this thing, I had no idea what I was doing. Just that I wanted to share my story and I hoped I wasn't alone. I've discovered that so many people need to find solidarity. They need to know they aren't alone. Well, I'm here to tell you, you are not alone. We can have these difficult conversations in the light of day. We can laugh, joke, and get serious about making change. I've tried to create multiple entry points within this movement, and I hope you will take some time to check out all of our resources and consider sharing your story on our website, ifyoucouldseeme.com. There you can submit your story, find mental health resources, submit ideas or resources yourself, read the stories of other brave warriors, find out about future live events, and invite me to speak or give a workshop in your area. If you're inspired by what we're doing, I hope you'll consider helping out by visiting our Patreon page, patreon.com slash if you could see me, purchasing my book, rating and reviewing this podcast on iTunes to help people find us, or just send me a message to let me know how this project is impacting you, ways we can improve, and future podcast or blog topics. This was only an idea until amazing people like you joined me in bringing it to life. Enjoy the show. Hello, friends and family. This is Erin Mahone once again with the If You Could See Me podcast. Welcome again for another amazing episode. Today we have our first return guest, our first second timer. Hooray! Uh, that means that we've been doing this for a while and we, uh, and we keep coming back and we have folks who, uh, who keep wanting to show up and tell us, uh, tell us their stories. Today I am joined by the uh, incredible, amazing, inspiring, uh, joyful light carrier, Miss Christina Tinker. She is a motivational speaker, the founder of Christina Tinker Talks, a workshop facilitator, and um, most relevantly to this show, she is a participant in our upcoming If You Could See Me Project event on January 11th here in Richmond, Virginia. Deep breath. Christina, welcome back to the show. Hi, Erin. Thank you. I'm honored to be back on and, and have another conversation with you. Thank you so much for being here. You're here on my birthday. I get to spend my birthday with you. I know. I know. <laughs> Happy birthday. Happy Good birthday. Night. Actually, we get to spend my birthday weekend together because we are uh, participating in a really wonderful event this weekend, a celebration of inclusion here in Richmond with, uh, at the RVA Creative Wellness Center with the folks from, uh, oh gosh, now I'm blanking. What's the project? Project, oh, no, project just, like just Like You. you. And Brickworks. Oh. Yes. And and Brickworks. Brian. Yeah, I know. It's going to be amazing. I'm so excited to talk about yes. inclusion. So last time you were here, we talked a lot about um, your your sort of history and your business, which was at the time as the owner of the Richmond Moms blog, which you have since sold and moved on to uh, bigger, uh, bigger, different uh, things. And, uh, and more specifically, now you are really uh, digging in and talking about your experience with your with an eating disorder uh, in your youth and your continued recovery and uh, so we wanted to have you back on just to kind of expand that 
a conversation and talk a little bit more about, you know, mental health and where eating disorders kind of fit into that and, you know, what, what your path and your journey has been. So, um, you know, let's just, let's just jump on in. What made you want to come back and, and talk about this specifically and join if you could see me and, uh, and do all the things that you're doing? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Erin. Um, you know, it's funny. There's so much of the work that I've been doing over the last, I would say, decade um, of my life. So uh, spending time as an executive coach with sales and marketing people, founding the Richmond Moms blog and launching a parenting community here locally, um, a website and that kind of thing, as well as continuing on into my um, workshop facilitation and the leadership and transformation work that I'm doing now. There's been this core component um, of courage and of culture. And when I think about all of the different um, areas, I guess, that I feel called to work in, um, those are the things that keep rising to the top is this idea that um, I feel called to help people cultivate courage in their own life, in their organizations, in their families. And then that that really creates a culture um, in which we can either thrive or suffer. And the reason I'm particularly interested um, in talking today about how my eating disorder story fits into that and mental illness as a whole and why I joined your incredible, incredible movement, um, and if you could see me, is that I have experienced such personal freedom in sharing the, this story, sharing the struggles and the challenges and the continued recovery um, what it means to be in continued recovery from an eating disorder and shed a light on the fact that um, eating disorders are a mental illness. And that that's a particular um, topic that I feel very passionate about helping people understand because as you and I have discussed so many times, you know, stigma is a huge factor in everyone's struggle with mental illness, no matter what, you know, the diagnosis is, right? There's so much stigma, there's shame associated with it. I think we're in a place in our culture where we're starting to be more open to that. Um, it's, it's, you know, on a broader uh, platform, people are having discussion around things like suicide prevention and mental illness. But in reality, eating disorders continues to be one of the most largely misunderstood um, topics. And many times I've had people say this to my face, well, can't you just choose to, to eat or not eat, you know? Right. Um, and so I think it's important to help people understand that it's not a lifestyle choice um, to be anorexic, right. not a lifestyle choice to suffer from bulimia. Um, it is a mental illness and it requires the same, um, you know, treatment and recovery and ongoing support and, and all of those things. So I'd, I'd like to explore that a little bit and help people maybe unpack um, this, this topic of eating disorders. It's such a good point because, um, you know, that is so often the the thing that we all hear is, you know, what do you have to be depressed about? Mm -hmm. Just don't worry so much. Don't be mm -hmm. so anxious. Don't, mm -hmm. don't have those suicidal thoughts. Just try and imagine how good your life is and how many things, you know, you do have. And, you know, just... I, I have had people, you know, in my, in my world say similar things to be about, by, about my depression. You know, you have so much to be grateful for. Why are you depressed? Like, what do you have to be sad about? Right. And I'm like, you know, I, I, you're right. And, and the truth is I have nothing to be sad about. And yet here right. we are. Right. Here exactly. we are. And I wish it were so easy as to simply talk myself out of it. That's right. We want things to be logical. We want to be able to, to you know, make things happen or not happen. I think one of our most fundamental, um, you know, desires as a human, and we all, this is on a, a continuum, of course, but you know me well. And so you know that I struggle with this um, valiantly, but, you know, that need for control. <laughs> yes. And we all have that, right? Some of us have a higher capacity to deal with the uncontrollable than others. But in reality, when it comes to our life, we all want to have the sense that we have some level of control over our own you know, destiny. And I think that's particularly um, evident when we talk about mental illness. Well, you have so much to be happy about, or there's nothing wrong with you. You're a normal size or, you know, and, and it seems like, why can't you just choose to be, to be, to be different? different? Why can't you just choose to not be this way? Um, and again, I think that's where kind of taking that veil away and saying, look, this is not as simple as a choice. There are absolutely daily choices that I can make to not let my eating disorder swallow me. 
Right. But, but it is a, da- it's a daily, daily choice. endeavor. Yeah. It That's is right. a daily endeavor. It is not just, I'm going to choose not to be this thing. Yes. And then it's done. It is an yeah. ongoing process. And so much of that, you know, that sort of judgment and, and you know, blame and, and sort of askew, the, mm-hmm. the way that people sort of look at you askew as if they they're dubious about your, your motivations or whatever. I think a lot of that comes from what I am trying to sort of parse out in all of these conversations is the, the fear that the person who doesn't understand your mental illness, that place of fear that they are approaching their interaction with you from. Mm. from which they are approaching their interaction with you. That was, a, 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 I think, a better grammatical way of saying that. Um, right. <laughs> but uh, the idea that you're absolutely right, that we all like to think that we have control over our s- circumstances and our thoughts and our lives and, and the choices that we make. And for, for some, the idea that my thoughts are out of my control is more than they can grasp uh and w- because that's very scary to most right. people right right that's right because you know that the to be human right is to see ourselves in one another even when we claim that we can't i yeah. think sometimes the more difference we claim to see is actually oftentimes where we're seeing yes. a reflection of ourselves that we don't maybe want that, we're, to. that frightens us yes right that frightens us that's absolutely right and so if if you have thoughts or you have, you know, things in your life that are uncontrollable, oh my gosh, does that mean that I might too? And and it is, it's, it's just, it puts us straight into a place of fear. It puts us oftentimes into a place of being defensive. I think sometimes even I remember in my particular journey in, in high school and then my early college years, the people that loved me the most were the ones who struggled the most with accepting, right. That this is a mental illness um, and that we're going to have to get treatment and and all, because it was like, no, 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 no. You're, you're, you're so capable. You're so smart. You're so everything. Let's just, let's just fix this. Let's just, why can't you live up to your potential? Right. Right. So, um, so that's important. And, you know, I think along these lines, you know, part of what we're talking about then is the increase all mental illnesses, there's such shame, there's such hiding, there's such a sense of, um, you know, what's wrong with me? Why can't I, I be better? And you talk about something like this with eating disorders, when someone might see it as not even a mental illness or something right. that would be out of your control, right? So that shame just continues to be sort of poured on top of you. Right. And, you know, one of the statistics that, that we know about eating disorders is that anorexia in particular has the highest mortality rate of any other mental disorder. Right. And because, you know, some, obviously some people die, um, from complications due to, you know, related to starvation, Right. but the suicide rates are also much higher Very among high. women who have anorexia than women who have other, uh, mental disorders. And mm-hmm. that was a really eye opening um, statistic for me when I first learned it. And it's been consistent by the way, over gosh, the last decade, I think. Right. I am fortunate to say I did not struggle with suicidal, um, thoughts during, during the, the real, um, you know, worst years of, of my eating disorders battle, but I certainly can see how that's possible. And, um, the distorted image that you have of yourself, not just physically, but you have a distorted image of yourself, you know, emotionally, spiritually, how you relate to others. Eating disorders are extremely isolating, um, and manipulative, you know, and you begin to believe in altered truth about who you are, how you, you know, are in the world. To the world. Yeah. 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 So that's so talk to me about the um the process of deciding to come forward with your story and how that has impacted you. I mean, we mm-hmm. we all know generally how how you know in most cases we have all had you know positive experiences, but what are those specific uh, Christina experiences mm-hmm. that have, um, that have validated your decision to come forward? You know, I guess the most clear validation, um, in terms of sharing my story and now over the last, oh gosh, I don't know, 10 years of, of sharing, um, this with 
different people as young as junior high school students, you know, up to, to, to grandmas and grandpas um, has been just the freedom and, and really recognizing that even though I was in re active recovery um, and, and living, you know, a healthy life at a healthy weight at a healthy, you know, size. And I had done years and years of, of cognitive behavioral therapy and, and address the underlying issues of anorexia, of anxiety that were, you know, driving some of this, um, really recognizing that until I publicly shared, um, my true story, that there was still a level of captivity that was present in my life mm -hmm. because by virtue of being recovered and then going on to have this really, you know, I had a, a pretty great career out of college and did some great things and had this beautiful family. And all of a sudden it almost became like, that was like, I had to live up to this expectation right. of this amazing recovered woman. This who, is what recovery looks like. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, it was through some of the work that you and I are doing together right now that I really began to face the reality that even at 40 years old, I'm still daily in recovery. There are still days that I, you know, battle the, the emotional part of not liking the size of my thighs or questioning whether a food is good or bad. And, um, you know, that's, that's active recovery. That's what it means. It's, we don't get to flip a switch. So I think that recognizing that there was still a level of captivity, sharing my story, um, in the first place that I really shared my story was I founded a nonprofit organization um, back in Texas where I'm from called Eat to Live the year my first child was born. And I struggled. I had been um, in recovery since I was 27 and then Alex was born when I was 30. And when I got pregnant, I struggled with really not a recurrence of the eating disorder in terms of behavioral. I, I didn't engage in the behaviors of, of anorexia and bulimia while pregnant because I think I had enough fear and common sense um, of the life that was growing inside right. of me. Mm -hmm. But the absolute mental anguish and obsession around what was happening, allowing my body to grow and gain weight and all of those things, I mean, it wreaked terrible havoc on me emotionally. And I suffered with um, postpartum anxiety and depression. It was in the, that moment that I realized I can't keep hiding this. I can't keep hiding this. It keeps showing up in my life in different ways at different times. And it grabs hold of me and it strangles the joy out of everything that is good in my life. Mm -hmm. And I won't let that happen anymore. I'll speak into the darkness. Right. Um, you know, and there's this quote that I love that, you know, sickness grows in the dark. Yep. And it was in that moment that I just realized, look, if I'm going to be sick, and continue to have these thoughts, I'm going to do it in the light and I'm going to do it where people can love me and help me. The support and, that I need. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was just moment after moment, founding that nonprofit, I went on to create a curriculum where I went in and um, spoke to, to, you know, junior high and high school students about what it means to really understand the feelings of anxiety and recognize when we're struggling with issues of control or feeling out of control, perfectionism. And the more I spoke, the more people came up and said to me, oh my gosh, I needed to hear this, or oh my gosh, I'm struggling. It, you know, every, every little moment like that was a nudge from the universe saying, please keep talking, please keep talking. People need to hear this. Yep. It's so funny. I just recently had um, a, 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 an interview with one of our other participants and we talked about that exact same thing that those little nudges from the universe just the the you know the, where you'd get just enough to get through the next day or the next event or yeah. the next thing that tells you you know even in the times where you feel like this is not making a difference it is and you just have to keep going mm -hmm. yeah and I, you know I had and I had another conversation this morning with someone who said you know how are you? And you know, you're, you're doing all these great things. And, and I said, you know, it just never feels like enough. And she was like, well, you didn't really pick a, an easy topic to <laughs> try and move the needle on. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's a really big ship you're trying to turn here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, okay, yeah. that's, you're right. Thank you for that perspective, you know? And right. so, Oftentimes, it, that encouragement 
um, and those little messages from the universe do come in those in very small ways. But it's also, you know, you realize that when you hear from one person, it's not small for that one individual oh person. It's huge. And often right. it changes their entire perspective on who they are and, and how they communicate with the world about about themselves and their story and what's possible. And so, um, yeah, it's, uh, that's right. Yeah. Fascinating. And the other thing that I think has happened to me throughout this journey as well is that I think there was a lot of, of, you know, pressure. So the sources of a lot of, of, of my personal mental illness, um, comes from, um, perfectionism, anxiety, you know, right. ex- extremely, um, hardwired to, to, um, you know, to be a performer, um, coupled with childhood trauma that I experienced and, um, a horrific catastrophic accident that my younger brother experienced during our youth. Right. And so I think it was kind of the, the, those elements all coming together that crashed and, and kind of manifested itself very quickly because I mean, my eating disorder was not a slow progression. It was like an overnight type, um, experience. And I think the other thing that has happened is that because of that natural instinct to, you know, perform, to fix things, to drive, to, to make something have meaning, even as, as a recovered person, when I first started talking and started sharing and created this curriculum, I had this, it was like, okay, I have to help people. I have to use my story for good. My story cannot be used for anything other than, you know, other people not struggling or healing other people. And, and it became about, I need to be the helper. I need to help. And what's happened to me throughout this journey, and I actually had a discussion with a um, colleague in my professional world yesterday about just this thing, even as a leadership trainer and developer, you know, if we shift our perspective sometimes to, hey, I'm here to help, as opposed to, hey, I'm here to actually be curious and learn something about you while sharing my story. And it just totally changes the experience because- yeah, our story has meaning and, and it's going to, you know, impact someone. And we're going to get those nudges from the universe of, oh my gosh, thank you for sharing. You've mm-hmm. opened, you know, the door for me to maybe share one day for myself. Yeah. But it also allows us to not pressure ourselves that we are responsible, you know. We don't for- take on that responsibility no. for other people's success right. and happiness and, no. and growth and yeah. No. And that we're still learning and that because we are in active recovery or active treatment or wherever, you know, you are in your personal journey with, with your mental health struggle, that it's okay to still be learning. It's okay to still, you know, that's giving and, and share, taking um, from each other, I think is where so much of the magic actually ends up happening in terms of mm-hmm. courage creation and empathy and, and all of those things that we need so desperately when we are healing um, from mental illness or trauma. Well, and you know, it's really, it also, and I, you know, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but, um, you know, the, the idea that somehow I have to be completely done with my journey in order to be ready <laughs> or, uh, worthy of sharing my story. And, you know, what is true is that you share whatever the story is today and what wisdom you've gained along, you know, from the process uh, uh, to this point. And then tomorrow, next week, in 10 years, you have a different story to tell and you gain the, you share the wisdom that you've gained from the next leg of the journey. You know, a lot of the stories that I tell are, you know, have wisdom that I, it has taken me, you know, 40 years to, to, to sort of put in place. And, Mm -hmm. you know, there are stories that I'll tell in 10 years that I'm not ready to tell now. And, That's right. Um, right. Or something's been added on. You know, you exactly. thought the story was over. Or I've and learned, then, right. I've learned you know, more. Yes. Right. Well, no, it's such a rel- it's, it's, that's just, I feel like that's been a major theme for me over the last six months in terms of, um, I'm a real big fan of finish lines. I really like finish lines. Like I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm a goal girl, you know? Yes. Um, and of course this is the time of year when everybody's setting goals and we love to think about that. And it, it's right. been really, um, incredible experience for me to learn a lot from my husband, frankly, because he's, he is the polar opposite. He's a journey guy. He is, he's a journey guy. I mean, he's right. just all the way. Um, and he, I mean, he, he sets goals and he meets them and all of those things professionally, right. but in terms of how he approaches life, mm-hmm. he just approaches it, um, from, you know, behind the wheel of the RV and let's see where we're going. And right. I am like, where is the high speed train? I don't understand what we're doing here, you know. And where's the um, itinerary? 
<laughs> and how do I? Oh, like, hey, help me. Yes. <laughs> I got to cram all the stuff in and we got to do all the things. Yes. And- yes. And so, you know, that in itself, um, as it relates to this recovery and mental illness and, and really starting to understand exactly what you just said that, look, there really isn't a finish line. And frankly, if there is, it probably means maybe life is over for me. It means right? you've, di- you've died. Life. <laughs> you you, know? It means you've died. Yeah. That's, the, that's yeah. the finish line. Yes. That's- <laughs> yeah. And I'll tell you, and so I've been, uh, you know, one of the things that I knew was going to um, happen, uh, I just sort of, I, I knew universally, if you will, that at some point um, there would be a book about eating disorder recovery and the sharing of stories and that sort of thing. Um, but I, I did continue. I think subconsciously there was a hesitation, right? That, okay, I needed to have the beautiful ending. And I, I still wasn't quite there because there are still those days that I can't look in the mirror or that I'm, you know, don't like the way my pants fit. And, and so when that day came and I really was the size I was meant to be forever. And I really did, you know, was able to eat the brownie at the party, whatever, then the book would be written. And, and it was all, you know, that classic, if, if this happens or when this happens. And mm-hmm. um, a, a friend here locally, um, Kathy Brown, she's a, another local writer, our paths crossed in the parenting communities first. And when I shared this with her, just frankly, very nonchalantly, we were just talking about our past and why we did what we did. And, you know, I, I kind of shared um, about my eating disorder. And she shared with me very openly that that was one of the first times that she'd ever had, you know, an adult conversation with another woman in the same uh, phase of life as her who had had a struggle. And it opened up a whole, um, just a whole world for her to explore that she had also been interested. So anyway, we're working on our book project together, which we'll publish the, it's a collection of essays. Um, I couldn't be more excited about it because it's stories for women all over and men, by the way, Um, because yes, eating disorders do affect more women than men, but men are affected you know, both genders are affected. Um, But they're from all over the nation, totally different experiences, totally different backgrounds. Um, And it just, again, it emphasizes that point that we all have our experiences. We all have our story. This particular struggle um, in terms of the mental illness lens is, is eating disorders. But you'll see so many themes in these stories that will make you say, oh my gosh, me too or I'm not alone. Um, And it really validates that human experience of struggle, of sometimes triumph um, and sometimes not. So I knew that that was kind of coming, but where I was going with that uh, additionally is that in terms of needing to sort of be, you know, recovered to help. So my daughter, um, who's only five years old, started having eating issues about 18 months ago. And over the course of way more than we have to talk about on this, <laughs> on this podcast, but she, she ended up finally seeing someone. Um, and we, we recognize that she does have a condition called pans and her particular rather most children with pans or pandas have OCD tendencies. Um, a small percentage of them actually have what's called restrictive eating disorder. And so here I am, this woman who has publicly talked about her battle with anorexia and bulimia over 17 years and, you know, all of these things. And I have this kid who won't eat and isn't gaining weight and, you know, et cetera. And, and it was like the universe saying to me, you just don't get to finish. You, you just right. don't get to wait. You don't get to wait. There's no pretty bow to package this up. This is something that's going to be in your life and you have to handle it. Um, and I don't know, Aaron, it was just one of those moments in my life where I went, okay, sign number <laughs> yes. 112 that I, that I don't get to be in charge, right? Yes. Um, uh-huh. But I know things. My life has taught me lessons and I have things that I can help her with. And I probably have more capacity for compassion and understanding and patience than almost anyone could with this particular child and this particular challenge because of you know, my, my own story. And I need to just embrace that. Yeah. Um, and so anyway, that's, you know, I think we no, all probably have stories like that where it's, it's just in our face. Right. And it's, and, and, you know, when we sort of circling back to the beginning of our conversation, mm-hmm. those are the choices we can make. Yeah, that's right. We don't get to choose whether or not we have an eating disorder or depression or, you know, cancer or diabetes or, you know, any of those, we don't get to choose that stuff. Right. 
but we do get to choose how we show up to it and we do get to choose how much torture we put ourselves through in the process of being whoever it is that you know the universe has made us into that's and, right you know it is it is an ongoing it's a job it's a practice um being a human <laughs> So and, much so, <laughs> you yeah. know, I you 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 wish, you wish and you hope that you could put yourself on autopilot and just and just you know not ever have to think about any of these things. But in truth, you know, the most evolved individuals, the people who, you know, we you know, I know you and I, but so many of us aspire to be are the people who don't live on autopilot, are the people right. who are intentional about their thoughts and their actions and their um, interactions and, uh, you know, and, and understanding their, their challenges as, as gifts is also a choice. Yes. You know? Yes. So much so. And it's funny as you were describing that, I'm thinking about there's this sometimes when um, there's a leadership course that I facilitate that has some pretty complex ideas that you sort of have, it's the foundational principles, right? To, to understand and they're very complex and, and, and deep and that you've got to unpack them a little bit. And a lot of times there's quite a lot of pushback in the beginning, right? And people are just, they're just struggling. You just see it on their face and the questions and it's, it, they're really wrestling, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we say is, look, it's actually incredible that you're wrestling with this and that you're struggling so much to wrap your head around this because if you weren't, it would mean that you were dead to the possibility that there's a different way of seeing the world, you know? And yeah. I think about that in light of what we're talking about right now is that, you know, the fact that it's daily, that it's a daily struggle, that it is such practice to get up and be human every single day. Um, I think it means that we're, that we're alive to the yes. actual life that's happening around us. And, mm -hmm. you know, you've heard me say this um, as part of, as part of our project that, gosh, the gift of my anxiety is the heightened sense of awareness and empathy that it brings into my life. Yep. And I feel like sometimes it makes me this crazy, super sensitive, deep, overly emotional person. Yes. But if the opposite of that is that I don't get to feel the joy and the excitement and the absolute pure pleasure of life, then I don't want it. You That's know, right. guess what? I've been there. I lived numb for 17 years. I have no interest in that. No, um, it's not worth it. No, it's what you, what no. you give up is, is not worth it, but it yeah. is, it is ultimately more work when we, you know, the thing that, that always comes to my mind when, you know, when I have these sort of large conversations, large scale conversations about the way things should be mm -hmm. is that the way things should be are hard. They require a lot of us individually and collectively and systemically. Mm -hmm. They require us to show up for one another and to one another. And this isn't a political thing. It is a mm -hmm. true thing mm -hmm. that, you know, we have to be connected to one another in order to f foster and facilitate the kind of compassion that we expect mm -hmm. within our communities. And that is hard. Mm -hmm. That requires us to, to, to be uncomfortable often. It requires us to look inside of ourselves and to do what you were just talking about, to ask big questions and to imagine that things could be a different way. Yeah. And yeah. we have to want to do that. And until we want to do that, we won't do that. Mm -hmm. um, until we want to embrace the discomfort of, you know, becoming, uh, which I love that uh, Michelle Obama named her book Becoming, because mm -hmm. I have two chapters in my book called Becoming uh, and Becoming Again, because I wrote a piece in 2006 <laughs> and then I wrote another one in 2016 about yep. being a mother and yep. about fostering our children in the process of becoming whoever it is that they're going to become mm -hmm. and, you know, being present to whatever it is, you know, that they need measuring our own expectations and showing up to them in a way that allows them to, um, to not just be extensions of us right. on right. autopilot, but to actually become who they are and to learn how to ask for what they need. That's right. Um, 
And, that's and I don't know about you, but I know as a parent, I mean, that's been probably one, one of the most um, powerful and continuous themes in my life as I've been a parent for 10 years now is that allowing the child to unfold as opposed to trying to mold them right yep. into who they are. Yep. And this is a, oh, admittedly huge struggle for me, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, because you have those tendencies, but be well-mannered, but do these, you know, and, but really if you're intentional and, and you just continue to come back to trying to help that child become and, and, you know, unfolding who they are, um, gosh, that's been such a powerful experience for me because it's healing and restorative as you go through that with them, right? Because you start to recognize in yourself. Wow. It is the, it is the ultimate lesson mm. in relinquishing control. Yes. Because yes. it's sort of a perfect, um, it, it is an immediate reflection of the ways in which we try to control our environment. You know, a child who you try to, you know, gird too tightly and mold too specifically um, without regard for their own needs will immediately recoil. They will right. immediately respond to you. And if they do, if you put them in that position often enough, your life will be very difficult. Yeah. And we don't have a lot of opportunities uh, in our lives as humans to have that sort of immediate reaction from the universe. That's right. That's right. And, and it is just, you know, I mean, I learned very quickly, these people, and I have very um, strong willed, independently minded, stubborn as hell children who I, you know, admire deeply <laughs> for that uh, quality. Yeah. But they have just let me know very, you know, fervently throughout their lives. Um, you know, I'm not your monkey. Like right. I'm not going <laughs> to show up and dance whenever you want me to. Yes. And I never, I didn't learn that. I mean, I was yeah. everybody's monkey. I showed up and, you know, they said sing and I said, okay. That's right. Do it. Perform. This Perform. is a performance. This is, you're yeah. here for us. You're that's here to right. validate our existence. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, that's right. So it's, it's well, hard. and I think I want to tie that to something you, you said earlier about, you know, connection and um, that need for belonging, that need for connection. I know that you and I share this fundamental belief that really that is at the core and science has proven this, yes. you know, but that is our most basic need in terms of a psychological, emotional, you know, need mm -hmm. um, is that need to belong to something, right? And that need to be connected. Um, and I think what's so just really, I don't know, it, it makes me go, oh my gosh, you know, look at the brokenness in the world, et cetera. And I think every generation, uh, we think the world is really bad right now. And frankly, it is, I mean, just objectively speaking, right? Yeah. We have some real problems going on, but I think every generation, if we're honest with ourselves, has, has had yeah. similar, um, you know, experiences. Mm -hmm. But if you look at, certainly in this country, the history of this country, I mean, so much of our fundamental um, societal focus has been on efficiency, effectiveness, yes. developing, right? How do we get better? How do we get faster? How do we get more? How do we produce more? Right. So right. more. And if you think about it, I mean, it's, it's, this is a personal belief here, but I mean, I think the pendulum has swung so far mm -hmm. that what you're talking about right now, that recoil of a child, I think we're experiencing it as a nation. Those of us that are um, we have our eyes open. We are awake to the reality of what it means to be human. We're recoiling and we're saying, yep. I, I simply refuse to operate in a world devoid of human connection mm -hmm. and belonging and compassion and empathy. And you can call those soft words if you want to. Um, they're called literally living words. I mean, yes. this is, these are the things that are required to actually continue breathing and thriving um, in this world. And so I think that while it feels really, I mean, talk about discomfort, right? I mean, there's a lot <laughs> of discomfort yep. going on. I think that it means um, we are, we're, we're standing up. I think one by one, you know, we're starting to stand up and say, no, this is not okay. Yes. Um, and I'll use my voice. I'll use my story. I will make myself vulnerable for the sake of, of humanity here that this is not okay. I, I can't survive or thrive um, in, this, in this environment. And that's why I think we're finally opening up to hearing more broadly um, on bigger platforms in circles that frankly, I, I really was 
you know, not expecting them to maybe respond as quickly as they have Mm -hmm. um, to these types of really deep, really powerful, but also just really fundamental dialogues around. I think people are so, you know, need and all those things. So, yeah, you're right. I think people are so, they don't even realize, and this is, this is why it's important to keep doing this um, because they don't even realize that they're hungry for it. Mm. until they get a taste of it, until they hear it, until they hear us talking like this, until they, you know, they are offered an opportunity to be involved in these conversations. Yes. And then they go, oh man, yes. I like, I, I didn't know, I didn't know why I was feeling so disconnected or not human or not valued or, you know, I mean, not everyone in the world is a millionaire and a top earner and a top producer. (laughs) And, you know, your value should not, no human value should be determined by how much money you have in your bank account. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and we are, you know, by virtue of the way that our country operates, which, you know, there are many benefits to all of it. Um, that's another conversation for another day for, you know, with an expert on capitalism, I guess, but, um, but it can't just be that. And when we only operate from that perspective, we leave out the voices and we silence the voices of so many people whose value expands far beyond, you know, what their monetary worth is. Oh, that's right. Well, and for those of it, like you said, I, I, I fundamentally believe what you're saying in terms of the um, people sometimes don't even know what they want. I've said that about the young people in our country right now. Yeah. I mean, many of them don't even know what it is because they've literally never experienced it, right? right. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're a child and, I, you know, I'm going to make a generalization, but if you're a five-year-old child who is growing up in a family where two parents, you know, if they even sit down at the table, they've got a phone in their hand, they've got a laptop, an iPad, a screen, you know, we don't even know what connection feels like right Right. now if we're growing up in that environment, right? So there's just a totally different um, dynamic going on. But I think the other thing that is a result of that is that related back to this topic of eating disorders or whatever else sort of manifests in the midst of that disconnection. I mean, why does it manifest? As I said, mine came from this underlying source of, you know, being wired for perfection and anxiety and, you know, the need for control, et cetera. Well, that's where the genetic and the, you know, biological stuff comes in. But then there's the whole societal, um, the whole social part of it that comes in that's also, okay, well, if I'm not feeling that at a human level, I don't feel imbalanced, right? There's something primal that goes off in me and I, I feel unsafe. I don't feel like my world is, is balanced. And so I have two kind of reactions to that. I mean, one is to just absolutely lash out and rebel. And the other is to try and numb, right? Yes. I think a lot of times we really downplay that numbing Mm -hmm. and it's very frankly, Erin, a topic that I have even been um, hesitant to bring up in my eating disorder advocacy work, because I don't like Personally, and this has been proven by many of the organizations that study eating disorders and in the research, I mean, there are common, there are some common themes in terms of recovering from an eating disorder to recovering from drug addiction or alcohol or mm-hmm. you know, anything else, but they're not the same. Um, they're not the same illness. And there's, there are some really um, big differences in terms of, of at the biological level. But what is true is the numbing part. I mean, there's the common theme, right? I need something to make this disconnection, this pain, this anguish, this suffering go away. And for me, anorexia, you know, was, was a, was a tool that I could use to numb that and to shut the world out for other people. It's cutting themselves. It's alcohol, you know, whatever it is. Um, and I think, gosh, we just, we don't, we get really uncomfortable, um, facing that reality as a culture here in America. And I think now even on the national scale, we, we want to blame it on something, right? Yes. Oh, it's, it's in our genes. It's in this, it's in that. I mean, no, there's some, it's science has proven. Yes. It runs in family. Eating disorders run in families, you know, mental illness of all kinds runs in families. We know that. Right. But there is also this whole other complex array of factors 
that um, have to do with our culture and um, our environment. And that's where I think we have some actual influence. And like you said, some level of choice and control and over how we can respond to that, what we allow ourselves to be part of or not part of. Um, and anyway, I hope that this, well, this I is think also that, opening no. up that conversation yes. too, right? That yes, there is a level of, it, you have to have an active role in your recovery or in your, right. you know, Treatment. And how much you engage in your recovery, you know, broadens the number of choices that you have in that oh. process. You know, what I'm saying is not, you know, we can choose how we react to things because that sounds the same as you have a choice. What I'm saying is that, you know, you are, I am, we are, um, you know, the, the more we engage in therapy and in, in our self-care and in our medication management and in our, all the different aspects that we, we use or tools that we use to manage our illnesses, those provide us with a broader array of, um, of, of tools to use to be able to show up in a conscious way and make a decision and to recognize when those triggers are happening, recognize right. when, oh, you know, this is, um, it's been raining for three days. And for me, that's huge. Um, and I'm, I'm day three. I don't want to get out of my bed. I don't want to move. I mm -hmm. can't like my body hurts. I, I, I feel like I, I just, you know, want to curl up in a ball and never move again. And, you know, I've got to recognize that in order to be able to approach it. And sometimes I can't, and that's right. true too. Sometimes right. I, you know, you have to just stay in bed or modify your life in a way that can accommodate for that need. That is, you know, so being actively involved in your recovery means that you get to have those, those bigger choices. And yeah. That's right. Yep. So I think sharing the story, learning what self-compassion even is and how to give it to myself. Um, yeah. and then giving myself that time, space and grace when I need it, which is what you were just talking about to say, look, everybody has bad days. Um, I mean, those are, if, if I were to say, what are the kind of the three things that keep, keep me going right now, just the day to day, um, combined with my faith and, and coming back to that, I do have a small, still voice inside me that I can hear if I really um, am willing to be quiet enough. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that it takes. And again, those are, you know, it's kind of countercultural, right? To sit and be still, to not be productive. To, <laughs> but those are the things that we know actually bring healing and wholeness um, to our life. And so it's experiencing those things over and over that you start to affirm, okay, yes. This would not be something that, um, you know, I would get a gold star for, right? But I know that it actually works for me. And so I'm going to keep doing it. And I think the more people that are willing to have those types of conversations with themselves and, and really own and um, be responsible for doing those things that they know do help them in their recovery, that's where we start to see real progress and where you start to feel, I think, that sense of forward movement in your recovery journey. Yes. I mean, I went to recovery centers. I, gosh, I went to at least three. I might've even gone to four, um, checked myself out against medical advice when I was 18, you know, refused, I would show up and pretend to, to do something and, you know, was hiding things and whatever. And people say, well, you can't get help until you're ready for help. And you can't, th and I think all of that is true. I think some of it also though, was what you just said. I didn't know what would help me because right. I was not in a place where I could even understand that. Yes. And so I don't look at them as every attempt for, for recovery that I, you know, didn't succeed in as a complete failure. I think each time was an exposure to something that right. over time, right. It was, a, it was another step down the, the yeah. path. Yes. And, I, you and know, when it finally was time. And I, I was at a place where I knew that my choice was between living an abundant life or living maybe no life at all, right. um, that I was able to, to make an active choice. And that's really hard for people that love you to understand. I yes. mean, that's just, I don't know how I would face that in my own life, you know, with one of my own children. Um, but I think it's something we have to be realistic about and understand, like you said, in the very beginning of this, that this is going to be a daily choice for this person for a really, really long time, probably forever, you know, probably forever. So probably forever. And 
that should be applauded. That should be, you know, valued that, you know, we, we, and, you know, I wrote about this in my book, the idea of, Mm -hmm. you know, only valuing the idea of big giantness of all the giant, big things that we accomplish. And, you know, I, we, I always go back to that self-compassion exercise that I created for myself, which was the, you know, the tiny wins, the idea that, you know, oh, well today it was a really big deal that I took a shower. (laughs) <laughs> right. Yes. Right. Yes. Because I really didn't want to do that. And that doesn't mean that that should be my, my, you know, the bar for my life is getting out of bed and taking a shower. But right. sometimes I, as you say, give myself the grace of recognizing that every single thing in my life does not have to be big giantness. It doesn't right. have to be, you know, uh, scaling Mount Everest. Like there is value in, I have uh, a really big struggle myself personally with the mundane aspects of day-to-day life. I Mm -hmm. think that everything is super boring and this is a whole nother show. (laughs) It's a whole nother topic that we'll cover next time we talk. But, um, you know, I have to will myself to engage in the mundane aspects of life because depression gives me so it takes away so much of my energy that if i don't have a burst of adrenaline going into something everything is practically impossible for me to accomplish right and right. so i know that about myself so sometimes i do applaud myself for being able to you know do the dishes and take out the trash and you know manage the <laughs> the everyday basic crap of life that I absolutely despise more than, you know, any reasonable person should. Exactly. And- exactly. <laughs> no, because it, and it goes back to that daily thing, that daily practice. And, you know, how do you, how do you build confidence in your, in your ability to handle, uh, you know, life's daily baloney, right. And all of those things and any of us that have any level of, of struggle with mental illness, I mean, gosh, we get, knocked down and it feels like this massive blow backwards. And yes. I, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think back, it's, this is funny because I'm, I'm always thinking about like business application in my mind. And it's, I think about all the years that I've coached salespeople and led sales teams, et cetera. And it's like, yeah, it's great when you get the big multi-million dollar win. I mean, everybody's going to cheer and you're going to go and, you know, have your happy right. hour or whatever. But the reality is, I mean, the people who move the needle for that organization or that team or whatever are the people who consistently make the daily deals happen every single day. Mm -hmm. And I think about that myself. I mean, remember the last time we were together and I, 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 and that proudly announced to you guys that I left my house without my, my beds made like that seems <laughs> ridiculous to everyone listening to this podcast right now, but I'm a 40 year old woman. And that was the first time in my life that I left my house to be on time somewhere without making my beds. I mean, that's a major step forward for someone who has issues with control, you know, right. and you don't have to applaud me for that. You don't even, you can think I'm a, a weirdo for saying it, right? But I recognize that that was a step for me and that even choosing to do it, even being open to the possibility that showing up where I was supposed to be on time was more important than making my, you know, all and of And those- then also <laughs> probably the biggest issue was then saying it out loud to a room full of people and now on a podcast. Right. (laughs) Right. That I know you will not edit out. So everybody- I will not. No way. I'm very (laughs) proud of you. Exactly. And it's like, okay. And hey, I'm still worthy and I'm still great and I'm still lovable and I'm still, you know, a, a, a fantastic human being that's here doing the very best freaking job I can. And I'm willing to show up and tell you about my obsession with bed making, you know, I mean, I think we just need more people <laughs> to be real, um, like, yes. that and, and just, just kind of, gosh, I just, I don't know. I'm my word for the year is abundance. That's uh-huh. something I've been personally needing to really embrace in terms of just abundance, um, both giving and receiving it. But also I've been thinking about this idea of, of just freedom because that's what I've been experiencing over the last, gosh, like I said, five years or so since I've started doing this work is just, I see so many people breaking free from bonds that they didn't even know they had on their lives yeah. um, when they start embracing the truth of who they really are. And I think it's, it's going to change organizations for the better. It's going to change our schools. It's going to change our faith organizations. It's going to change our 
flipping government. I mean, it's going to, it's going to change when people start seeing that there is freedom and simply showing up and doing the very best damn job they can every day, given what they're given. Um, so yes. Yes. What a magical, wonderful, Yay. perfect way to end this amazing conversation, Christina. You are oh, I just you are a light in the you. world. <laughs> well, thanks, Erin. I feel the same way about you. And what an honor to get to have such a beautiful conversation on your birthday. I hope the next hour is filled with hugs and cupcakes or whatever makes you happy. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Aww, take care. You're welcome.